All right, today we are starting a new message series. It's called, What Would Jesus Say? What would Jesus say? If he were watching the news in the flesh today, if you're walking the earth and, and watching our news, if he were seeing what's going on in the world, if he were monitoring our social media, what would Jesus say about the things that he saw? What would he say about the things that, that, that we, we care about today, that are on our minds, that are on our hearts? Uh, we're going to be digging into that, and, and how we dig into that is not just going to be about speculation of what he might say about these particular things that we're going to be addressing. We're actually going to look at what Jesus said in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And of course, sometimes we're going to have to take what he said there and, and apply it in a, in, in a way that applies to today and what we're facing today. But we're going to look at his words and see what he said about a variety of things. And these are important things that we're talking about over the next five weeks. So what we did is we made sure to get the word out as widely as possible, and the responses have been interesting. Just by naming the things we're talking about, income disparity, um, school violence, immigration, homosexuality, some people have gotten very concerned about that. Some people have responded very strongly, and we've not even talked about it yet. So, a big part of this series is going to be, and a big reason we're doing this, is to give us all tools to be able to have conversations, to be able to, to talk about these things, to listen to one another. Because when it comes to these particular issues, um, we tend to talk at each other, we tend to talk past each other, and we tend to accuse one another of being this or being that. And so what we hope to do it, as we strive to follow Jesus, that is to learn to have conversations, to ask people questions like, well, why do you believe what you believe about this? How did you get there? Tell me. And let me tell you where I am and why. Rather than talk at and past each other, let's learn to converse. And another thing I want you to know as we approach these very difficult subjects is I'm not going to tell you what to think. I never do. That is not my role as a pastor. I'm not going to tell you what to think. I'm going to bring everything that I know and can learn about Scripture to bear, and I'll tell you what I think and what I believe, but I'm not telling you that you have to believe like me. In fact, what I will tell you is that, that in our congregation, people already think differently. Our goal, our goal in addressing these things is, is, not, is not uniformity, that we all think the same, but our goal is this, unity that you can think differently than I think, than the people around you think, but we can still be you have unity in that one mission that we're trying to pursue. And that one mission is quite simple. That is to lead people to an act of faith in Jesus Christ. And Jesus prayed that we would be one. He did not pray that we would all agree we can be one in that one mission of leading people to Him and still disagree on some of these big issues. So it's unity, not uniformity. We need to learn to listen. Now having said all that, I want to pause real quick and ask you to do a couple things. One is to take some notes uh, there are some things that you're probably going to want to think about or things that you're going to want to remember, maybe share with somebody else. A great way to do that is just use your cell phone, open up your notes app, and take a few notes. Um, that way you'll have that with you all the time. There's also a little space available on your program to take notes. Another important thing I encourage you to do, use the study guide that's in your program or the study guide that's on our website. The one on the website is a little more detailed. The main goal through the study guide is to be in God's Word, to be in Scripture, to listen for God's voice within there for yourself. So you've heard me say this before if you've been here before. Don't take my word for it. Open the book. See how God speaks to you. Use the study guide somehow, some way. Now we're going to focus today in the first topic of this series on what would Jesus say to the 1%, to the wealthy, and to the powerful. Now, um, what would he say also to the 99%? But that phrase, the 1%, it actually comes from a movement that happened in the fall of 2011. And what happened is um, there were a, a group of young people, primarily college grads, that couldn't get jobs. They had recently come out of college. That was in the middle of the financial crisis that we were facing as, as, a, as a country, um, the Great Recession. They couldn't get the jobs that they had trained for and hoped for, or maybe some of them couldn't get jobs at all. But those frustrated young people saw that some of the folks that they believed were responsible for the economic crash were doing really, really well. And so they, they showed up and, and they camped out in a park across from Wall Street, and it became a movement called the Occupy Wall Street movement, where they began to articulate there's this one percent that doesn't seem to have consequences in their lives, that it doesn't seem to care about the rest of us. And, and that movement faded pretty quickly, but, but there were 1,500 cities where similar movements came up, and, and that, that 
phrase, the 1%, is kind of still lingering in our vocabulary because of how it spoke to the issue at hand. The movement faded, but we're going to talk about this, and I I need to remind you that the idea of poverty and inequality has been around forever. In fact, Jesus said it would always be a part of our lives. Jesus himself said that. So the question isn't about will there be wage and income disparity? The question becomes about what do we do about it? As people of faith, how do we address the ideas of, of opportunity and the ideas of poverty? And as we look at Scripture, what we want to ask is, if God cares about this, what is he calling us to do about it if we choose to follow Jesus? So in terms of wage and income disparity, I want us to look at some facts and kind of begin there. Um, You might want to jot some of these down too. Uh, Let's start with some national statistics. From 1974 to, excuse me, 1979 to 2014, the the top 20% of incomes over that 25-year period rose by about 100%. The top 10% of incomes in that 25-year period rose 150%. The top 1% incomes rose by 200%. The bottom 80% incomes rose 22%. So you can see right there, in that 25-year time period, people in the bottom 20% of earners saw their incomes grow by 22%, while the top earners saw their incomes grow by 100% to 200%. Now, when you look at that, you may wonder, okay, well, what what, what amount of income makes you in the top 1% or 10%? So here are a few national averages uh, to answer that. First, the average household income for Americans is $59,039. Now, that's not individual income. That is household income. And in the U.S., you're in the top 10% of income earners if you have a total household income from all sources of $170,432. You're in the top 1% if you have a household income of uh, $430,000 or more. You're in the top 0.1%. If your total household income from all sources is $1,135,000 or more. So that, that's just to kind of give us a sense of, of what, the, what these numbers really mean. And let's look locally. You might be interested in that. Here's a quick snapshot of Joplin and Carl Junction for 2016, which is the last year that um, we have uh, information available from the Census Bureau. So in Joplin, the average household income was 58605 so that's slightly below the national average. In Carl Junction, the average was higher than the national average at 80,940. So, again, a few more details, and we're going to jump in here. In in Joplin, you'd be in the top 10% of your household income if it is $100,000 or more. In Carl Junction, you'd be in the top 10% if your household income is $150,000 or more. In Joplin, uh, the bottom 10% of incomes had a household income of $10,000 or less. And in Carl Junction, the bottom... 10% 10% had income levels of $25,000 and below. So that's just a snapshot. That's just information. Now, one last bit of information I want us to look at um, before we consider what Jesus might say about the income gap in America. We've got to look at it this way. What does it look like when we look at the entire world and not just the United States and not just our corner of southwest Missouri? So if your household earned $32,400 or more last year, then you are in the top 1% of the world's income brackets. So which is, I'm thinking, most people in our congregations. And, and my point in showing you that statistic is that what I'm about to talk about applies to all of us, or almost all of us, not just a few. Now when we talk about income dispar- disparity, I, I want to say this up front. I don't personally know anybody that thinks everybody should make the same amount of money around the world or in the United States. I don't know anybody that thinks that. It it just isn't feasible, right? I mean, because the cost of living in Los Angeles is very different than the cost of living in Joplin, Missouri. And then then if you have a higher education, that should account for something, I believe, in in what you make and your income level. If you are an entrepreneur and you take a big risk and you start something from scratch, you should be rewarded if that risk pays off. If you are a hard-driving worker, I think you should get paid more than somebody that doesn't work as hard. I mean, those are factors that affect our, our income level and that income gap. In fact, I'll tell you a little side story here. Um, at my father-in-law's funeral last week, I had a chance to sit down and, and talk to the grandkids and ask them some questions about what they remembered of their grandfather. And one of them said this, I remember when all five of us grandkids came to the farm for a weekend <clears throat> and Grandpa uh, had us picking up walnuts 
because they were buying them in, in town. And so he said, yes, we can pick up as many as we can, and, and you'll get paid for that. And at the end of the day, they've been picking up walnuts, um, he was watching how they were working, and he paid more to those that he clearly saw worked harder than those that were slacking off. And he made sort of a show of it to say who got what and why. And that was an important lesson in their minds. And I think it's a true lesson. And I think it's an important lesson. But because of all these factors, cost of living, higher education, entrepreneurship, uh, those that are hard driving, there is going to be some level of inequality, and I believe that's healthy. That's how the world works. So the question then is about opportunity and poverty. How do we address these in light of income disparity? And there are a wide range of views on how we address this, right? I mean, there's some people who say, whatever you do, Don't tax the rich more in order to provide programs for the poor because what that does is it stifles economic growth, taking away their incentive to invest in creating new jobs. Taxing the rich will only hurt poorer people. There are other people who say, now wait, it's only right to tax the rich, the wealthiest, in order to have a safety net, in order to create opportunities so the poorest can get ahead in life. How else are they going to be able to start anything without that assistance? And there are debates all over that and everywhere in between those two thoughts. Now, I need to tell you this. I am not an economist, although I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express once. I'm not an economist. I'm a theologian, and I'm a pastor, and I'm a thinker, and I'm a little bit of an ethicist along the way. And, and there are, but I'm not an economist, and there are a wide range of views on how to resolve this issue. But I want to simply point out that Jesus says this issue matters. Opportunity and poverty should matter in our hearts and in our minds and in our financial practices. Now, here's the other thing. Jesus was also not an economist. He did not give us the answers of how we should address this and the economic programs that would help and and make it all go away. He doesn't give us that. He does say a little bit about taxes, though. If you read what he said, he, he said, give to Caesar that which is Caesar's, give to God that which is God's. But he didn't give us concrete answers about how to fix poverty and how this relates to the 1%. But he did say it matters. So let's look at what he said. Let's dig. So the Gospel of Luke, let's start there. Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. This is where Jesus actually preaches his very first sermon. So he goes back home. He's He's 30 years old. He goes back home to Nazareth. He walks into the synagogue that he had been in hundreds of times growing up as a kid, but he's a rabbi now. He is of, of the age to begin to proclaim. He is handed a scroll, and he opens up the scroll of Isaiah. And, and as he opens up that scroll, he turns to one particular passage and, and says these words, reading from Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the what? The poor. First words out of his mouth. I've heard it said that it's, if it's not good news to the poor, then it is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his very first sermon, he made that clear. He came to offer good news to the poor. Now, he came to offer good news to everybody too, the rich and the poor. And he spent time with the rich, he spent time with the poor and everybody in between. And he knew that for rich and the poor, that, that money would be an issue. There would be a lure of wealth that could really take people to the wrong place in dark places. Which is why Jesus said these words. He said, no one can serve two masters. Either you'll hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve. He's saying, this is what I'm talking about. You cannot serve both God and money. Jesus is pointing to the tension. That tension is real. It was real then, and it's real today. Do you feel it? Because I do. I do. Uh, uh, Here's an example. I Every day, I've got a few things that I carry with me everywhere I go. you probably got the, the same stuff. So, you know, I was, before I walk out the door, I pat myself down, make sure I've got my phone, my keys, make sure I've got my, my wallet. It's one other thing that I've got, my chapstick. I always got a chapstick. Anybody else? you got to have chapstick. So, but my wallet, and so I've got these things, and I always wear a cross. And, and I feel like these two things, my cross and my wallet, my, the symbol of, that I'm a follower of Jesus and this symbol of my monetary, my monetary life, I feel like they're waging for my soul every day, all the time. Anybody else? I mean, even as a pastor, there, there are days when if I look back and look at the time I spent maybe shopping for something on Amazon and the time I spent reading God's Word and, and praying and seeking God's will, I would have spent a lot more time on this. 
I, I feel that tension literally every day that my wallet and my faith are, are sort of at war with one another. It's a real thing. And Jesus says, okay, one of these things is going to be your master. Which one? You get to pick. The decision you make in picking affects everything else because the one will then serve the other. One reason I wear the cross is to remind me every day of who I am and what my life is supposed to look like even though I fail, even though I fall. Jesus said it this way, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is interesting if you think about it because it means that your heart follows your treasure. Wherever you put your treasure, your wealth, your financial interest, those sorts of things, that's where your heart will be. We've got to constantly remember that because, because the world, our culture around us, there's so many voices that are telling us, you know, if you just do this, if you put your treasure here, then you'll find some happiness. If, if you just put your treasure here, you'll find some peace. Isn't that what we all want? So put your treasure here, that's where you'll find it. And those voices are telling us that, yeah, what, what will really make you happy is, you know, bigger house, that third garage on your house, that car, that motorcycle, I don't know what it is that, that it is, but it's there. Then you'll be happy. It's a tension that Jesus is talking about. We live within it. So Luke tells a, a parable, tells several parables that relate to this. Things that Jesus spoke. And one of them is in chapter 12 of Luke, and it's about a wealthy man who's done really, really well for himself. I mean, he He's worked hard, we can assume. He has maybe even done his work fairly and accumulated wealth, but he begins to think, oh my gosh, I have so much stuff, I can't fit it in my house anymore. I'm going to put it in my barns. His, his wealth accumulates. He fills the barns. And, and so, oh my gosh, my barns are full. I have to build more barns. He builds more barns for his stuff. Think storage units. Think storage units, right? His storage units, his barns get full. And, and so he says, well, what I'll do is I'll tear them all down and build bigger barns. And so he builds bigger barns, fills those up too. Um, by the way, did you know that for the last five years, one of the fastest um, growing industries in the United States is storage units? Did you know that? It is a $38 billion a year industry $42 billion a year if you include the construction every year of new storage units. Now, why do we need storage units? Well, because we've got so much stuff, we can't fit it in the, in the garage or the basement or the attic. We can't fit it in there anymore, so we've got to have a, a storage unit to put it in. One article I read said, said it this way, storage units are where we store the overflow of the American dream. <laughs> That's a nice way of putting it. The Wall Street Journal said that we've become captive to our storage units because, because when we move stuff into them, we fill the space in our homes with what? More stuff, so we keep paying storage rental fees forever. Wow. Especially because it's such a hassle to go through that stuff in our storage units Unless we abandon them, and then our stuff gets auctioned off on that show, uh, Storage Wars. <laughs> so, back to the story. In the story that Jesus told about the rich man and his barns, he, he says in this parable that the rich man dies. When he dies, he's standing there before God, face to face. And God says to him, and I, I want God's voice to be very empathetic when he says this, you fool. Who's going to get all your stuff now? And Jesus wrapped up that story by saying these words, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth but not be rich toward God. What does it mean to be rich toward God? It means to, to do God's work in the world. Helping people, seeing people, how God sees people. And for this guy in the story, his treasure showed where his heart was. Where was his treasure? It was in his storage units with his stuff. Where was his heart? Locked up in a storage unit. That's why Jesus says this. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Let's say that out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Watch out. 
Another theme we see in Jesus' teaching that, that applies to this idea of income disparity is that God owns everything, and whatever we have is a gift. I mean, our ability to think, our time, our ability to breathe, our ability to earn, to work, just the fact that you're alive on the planet, and that's a gift from God. You don't own it. It's just on loan to you. And we see this so well in another parable that Jesus told in the Gospel of Luke. It's called the parable of the wicked managers. Don't you just love that title? He tells a story about a wealthy man who's about to leave for a while. And he puts his servants in charge of his estate. He, he trusted them. And he told them to be good managers of everything that he gave them. And while he's gone, though, these managers start to think he's not coming back, maybe. Been gone a long time. All this stuff is under our control. Let's do what we want with it. These managers start to abuse the workers who are beneath them. They start to party. They start to get drunk. And when they are least expecting it, what happens? The owner comes home. The owner sees how his managers are abusing his other servants and not caring for them and how, he, how they're mismanaging and squandering the resources. Here's what Jesus said, that that owner will cut them to pieces and send them off to be with the unfaithful. Yikes. Sometimes we like to bury some of Jesus' words. Now in the story, who's the manager? Or who's the owner? Who's the owner of, of what we're talking about here? It's God. God is the owner, and we're the managers. None of what we have is ours. We're just entrusted with it for a certain amount of time. And this was Jesus' way of getting our attention and saying that this matters to God. How you treat the least of these, how you manage your resources, it really matters to God. And here's how Jesus summed up what he was teaching in that. He said, from everyone to whom much is given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. When it comes to income disparity, we, we cannot avoid what God has called us to do. And that's to see that what we have belongs to God and he's charged us with working together for the good of all people. Now, there's something that we've got to talk about for a little while here because this can lean into charity. We have to understand charity. And our, our philosophy here at St. Paul's around charity is, is really important for us to know. We believe that there is such a thing as toxic charity. That, that there's a time to give people money and time to give people things, and that time is when they're in the middle of a crisis, after a natural disaster, after losing a job, after whatever that might be. There's a time to intervene and give money and, and resources to help them through that time when they cannot help themselves. But beyond the crisis, that kind of giving can actually create a wider gap between people and can make people dependent on that relief. And we do not want that to happen. That's relief. So our belief is that at some point, relief has to transition into restoration. And restoration is where we invest in people. We give them the chance to work their way out of that poverty with dignity, out of a place of need, out of a place of welfare, dig out of that hole into a place of being self-sufficient. But this takes time for the person working their way out of poverty and for those, maybe the 10%, the 1% that can help. And it means us giving our time and our energy, our relational capital, not just throwing money at it, but that's part of it, do it in the right way, but investing ourselves. We actually host a program here called Circles Out of Poverty. That's exactly what they do. Every Thursday night is, is about helping people create a circle around them of allies that invest their relational capital to help people out of that place of poverty. But it requires more of us, and it requires a constant awareness. I think it means that those of us in the 10% or the 1%, we have to constantly be asking ourselves questions about equity and about sharing and how we create systems that lift people up rather than just lift us up. Here's how Paul says it. Paul says, don't push your way to the front of the line. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside and help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Here's what I believe. Is that there always has been and always will be an income gap. But I think it's very important for those of us that are in the 1% or 10% to know that that gap 
is growing wider and wider and wider and wider. And we have to ask ourselves, how much is enough? And what happens when that gap grows so wide that something breaks? Something snaps. What has history told us about that? The outcome is not good. So Jesus has told us in the parable of the wicked managers that we will be held accountable for the resources and for the people that we're called to lead and serve and protect. For those of us in the 1% and the 10%, the call is to be in constant communication with God. So we're asking questions like this, what would you have me do, God, with what you have given me? Constantly asking these questions, not just once, constantly. How would you have me manage your resources, Lord? How do I bless others with this? How do I lift others up with this? How can I know when I have enough and I don't need any more? I was just talking to a a friend last week, and we were sitting at a table. He asked what I was going to be talking about uh, in church, and they live up in Kansas City. And so I told him, and he was like, you know, Aaron, I, I got some questions for you. He's a man who's deeply involved in his church He's a man who is deeply in his faith, who has given a lot of money away, very wealthy. And he said, Aaron, uh, how will I know if I'm giving, giving enough and doing enough? And I thought for a second, and I said, well, there might be several ways to answer that, but the one that comes to mind is that you'll feel it. You'll know you're giving enough if you feel it. If maybe there's something that you can't buy, or someplace you can't go, or something you can't do because of what you've given away or what you've committed to give. I don't know if that's the right answer. It's part of the right answer. Listen, I am all for people getting richer if they do it with integrity and they do it with truth and honest, honesty, but the call of Jesus is to make sure that that wealth benefits all people. And I think this means that those of us in the top 1% and 10%, we've got to be very careful not just to support laws and legislation that make us richer, especially at the expense of those who don't have a voice. So in light of all this, what should we do when we leave here today? What do you think Jesus would have us do when it comes to poverty and opportunity? Well, here's some things to consider. I mean, if you're looking to expand your business and you are in that role where you can do that, expand a business What would Jesus have you look for to maybe find ways to benefit a community that is poor, a community that that has been forgotten? How might you make a decision that would help that? Opportunities for good work. If you've had a tremendously profitable year in your company, I mean, do you keep it all for your own bonus and benefit, or do you share it with those whose lives will be greatly changed by a raise? And if you get a raise and get a promotion, a significant one, might Jesus ask you to stay in your current neighborhood? And rather than, rather than moving to a bigger neighborhood, a nicer house, to stay there and to invest that blessing in those neighborhood relationships that you've been developing? Remember, we're all about neighboring. Or might he even ask you to, might he even ask you to, to sell your home, even as your wealth increases, and move into a blighted neighborhood and make new neighbors? and invest your life in them. Here's the challenging, most challenging question that relates to all that. Do do you and I, do we have the courage to even ask that question of God? I hope you do. Would Jesus have the audacity maybe to ask you to become someone who gives not just 10% of your income away, but 20 or 30 or 40 or 50% of the income that he gave you? What would Jesus say to the 1%? To the 10%? And and remember, the 20%, remember um, that globally, almost all of us are in that 1%. What would he say to us? You've already heard it today. From everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. And from the one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. What would Jesus say to the 1%? We do not have to guess. It's right there. It's challenging, it's difficult, but when we live it out, it changes our very existence. Lines our hearts up more with 
God's heart. It not only changes us, but it changes those that we serve, that we're called to lead and empower and bring opportunity to. That's what Jesus would say. And for today, that is, that is the good news. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just roll over us. Roll over us and imprint on us your word so that we have your word rolling around in our minds, guiding us, nudging us to ask the question, what do you want me to do with what I have, what you have given me, Lord? Let your Holy Spirit roll over us and imprint upon us the importance of of understanding we don't own anything. You, you just called us to be managers, stewards. Imprint on us, Lord, that desire to know what it is you would have us do with what you've given us. Lord, for those that are part of our church family, that are in the 1%, we pray. For those, the rest of us, the 99%, uh, those especially in that 10% of lowest incomes, Lord, we pray that they know, too, that you are with them, you are for them, you care, you love them, you know them by name. Help us all to know that you are with us, you care for us, and you have expectations of us. And print that on us, too, Holy Spirit, as you roll over us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.